All right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, tonight we are going to begin our series through the book of Genesis. And tonight is going to be the introductory message about some of the features of the book of Genesis and how to approach the book of Genesis. Uh, I think you would get the most out of this message if you listen to it tonight, listen to it again uh, about the time Abraham dies. Uh, I believe that's Genesis 25. And then listen to it again at the end of the sermon. Because, or at the end of the sermon, at the end of the series, uh, Genesis. And the reason is because tonight I'm going to talk about various uh, ways to approach Genesis, how the book of Genesis works, how to read Genesis, uh, all of those things. And you'll be able to hopefully gain something for it tonight. But after we've walked through it for several months, uh, one guy always says a picture is worth a thousand words. After we walk through it and you see it in motion, to go back and re-listen to these principles and ideas, I think will help you gain a much stronger understanding of it than maybe you will have tonight. And then if you did it again another time at the end of the book of Genesis, I think you might really begin to have a, a pretty good grasp of the things that we'll cover tonight. So that's... Uh, uh, introductory uh, recommendation. If you feel somewhat overwhelmed uh, by the end of the, of the message, that's okay. We're going to break this stuff off in bite-sized chunks as, as we move forward. But this is just some introductory uh, things to consider about the book of Genesis. And the first thing I want to lay out is my own personal history with this book. I'm really excited to begin our Genesis series today and I'm, I'm filled with anticipation of the good things God might do in this series uh, during the next season in our church because I personally have had a wonderful special history with the book of Genesis that began probably about 10 or 12 years ago when I was in my theological training for the ministry. I remember, especially in this book, learning the rich connections that this book has to itself, that it has to the rest of the Old Testament, that it has to Jesus Christ, and that it has to all believers. And as I was studying th these things, I was just riveted by them and overwhelmed with joy, and it felt like the whole Bible was opening up. And so during that particular season of life, there was a, a point where I was between jobs for about six weeks. And I remember that during that time, God had me locked up literally about 14 hours a day for a month, doing nothing but devouring Genesis and its connections to the rest of God's word. And it was during that season that it was one of the sweetest seasons of worship with God that I can remember having uh, in my walks. One of those memorial highlight moments when you look back on your life that is just really stands out. And so when that season of unemployment ended and I, I, I went to the job that God had prepared for me, after I'd been at that job for about a year or so, I eventually was asked by the manager of that company to teach a Bible study for the office. And I taught our, our office through the book of Genesis. And it was through the study of Genesis and how richly it points to Christ that my manager was saved during that Bible study. And to this day, he is a strong believer who's serving God in Chicago and he's done missionary work in China. He's a really cool minister or ministry to these uh, gang member kids. I love this guy. And so he is a very dear brother to me and he got saved going through the book of Genesis. In other venues, when, we, when I've taught through the book of Genesis, I've seen God save other people as well. And so I just, I, I, I come to this book with just a lot of confidence and anticipation of what God might do through his word. And I think for me, obviously seeing people get saved is wonderful. But one of the other things I've really enjoyed about the book of Genesis and teaching through it is <clears throat> seeing people as they go through the book of Genesis, seeing their confidence in the word of God grow. That is something that I just absolutely cherish to see somebody understand what's going on, see them get excited about it, see them own it personally themselves and be able to put it into their own words. That is, I mean, that, that's why I preach the word. 
And so <clears throat> I'm excited for us to begin this series. And today's message, we're going to cover some important introductory issues pertaining to Genesis. And then next week, Lord willing, we will begin actually working through uh, the book of Genesis. Um, so to begin, some of the kind of uh, basic considerations when you begin a book is who is the author, uh, when was it written, and what is the setting? And so for the book of Genesis, Moses is the one who authored the book of Genesis as well as the first five books of the Bible, which in addition to Genesis are Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now these five books are often called the Pentateuch, which is, uh, the, and Pentateuch is a Greek word that simply means five books. And these five books, they are also sometimes referred to as the books of Moses. Or maybe sometimes they're just called Moses. Or other times the Jews would call it the Torah or the law. And so all of those things, especially depending on context, they're speaking to the first five books uh, of the Bible. Now with the, the, the phrase the law in the New Testament, depending on the context, the law can have a broad meaning. It can mean the five books of Moses. It can be a reference to a particular law, or it, it, it can even be a reference to the entire Old Testament itself. As we see in 1 Corinthians, Paul quotes Isaiah and calls it the law. So depending on context, the law, the law almost always speaks at least to the first five books. And sometimes uh, it's a little bit more narrow than that if it's referencing a particular law. So Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and there's uh, obviously one exception. The book of Deuteronomy, he wrote most of that, but the book of Deuteronomy records his death. So there's no way Moses can write about his own death. I believe that the person who completed Deuteronomy after Moses' death was Joshua. Joshua was his aide. Joshua uh, was with him, you know, when he's on the mountain, you know, with God and stuff like that. I believe Joshua uh, wrote the rest of uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So with the exception of the end of Deuteronomy, Moses wrote uh, the first five books. Now, <laughs> there is no end to the debates of scholars who question the authorship of Moses. And I honestly, like, this might disappoint you, but I'm not going to bog you down with that. I have a mic drop argument for why Moses wrote uh, the book, uh, why he wrote the book of Genesis. And I'm just going to appeal to the greatest mind in human history, the only true scholar, the only one who knows everything, and we'll see what he has to say about the first five books and Moses as the author uh, and, and, these and, and, and these books as scripture. So in my notes, which will be placed online, I have a much more detailed unpacking of Jesus's view of the five books of Moses, how he affirmed them all as scripture, how he affirmed Jesus, or I'm sorry, how he affirmed Moses as the author of each book. But for the purposes of the sermon tonight, because it's already a bit long to cut out about 10 or 15 minutes of going through that, I'm going to fast forward ahead to basically just one statement. But know that if you want more information on that, it will be available to you in the notes uh, uh, online. And so what I'm going to do to uh, argue for the authorship of Moses, uh, of Genesis, is just turn your attention to a, a very famous passage of Scripture. And it's a passage where Jesus calls, uh, uh, where Luke actually calls Moses, he speaks of Moses as a paraphrase for the first five books of Scripture. And that, that, that passage, it's in Luke 24, 27. And what's happening is Luke, Jesus, he's, he's on the road to Emmaus after, he's, he's with a couple of disciples, they don't know who he is, and it's after his death and resurrection. And so these guys are wrestling, oh man, you know, we're bummed out. You know, we thought Jesus was the Christ, but he died. And Jesus starts explaining to them from the scriptures how they, the Old Testament scriptures t uh, testify that Jesus had to die and he had to rise again. Now in recording this event, Luke tells us that Jesus taught them, this is Luke 24, 27. He says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, Moses right there and all the prophets, that is synonymous with the Old Testament. Because he says that he interpreted them in, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Well, at the time Jesus is doing this, what's all the scriptures? It's the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't exist at the time where Jesus is doing this. So beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interprets himself of what all the scriptures say about Jesus. Now, Moses is a paraphrastic statement for the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Later on in Luke 24, 47, it says, beginning with Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, that's a paraphrase of the Old Testament that gets a little bit more detailed for us. But in both statements, Jesus is declaring that Moses is the one who wrote, I believe that he's the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Moses. And so these first five books of the Bible, Genesis is included in that. Jesus sees Moses as the author of Genesis. And so I really don't care what the scholars have to say about who wrote the book of Genesis. Jesus said it was Moses. And in John 5, 48, Jesus gets a little bit more specific. He says, if you believe Moses, you believe me, because why? Who did Moses write of? Moses wrote about me, John 5, uh, 546, excuse me. So <clears throat> when we look at Jesus and what he says about the books of Moses and who wrote them, and if you dig more deeper uh, in some extra phrases that aren't in the sermon but are in the notes, we see how Jesus interacts with the first five books of the Bible as scripture. The only conclusion that you can draw when you look at how Christ interacts with those books is that the first five books of the Bible are scripture, they are authoritative in our life, and Moses wrote them. And so I'm not going to spend 40 minutes of the sermon going through a ton of different authorship debates. Jesus, is, Jesus interacts with it that way in the New Testament. That's enough for me. I hope it's enough for you. So Moses is the author. Um, <clears throat> he wrote Genesis sometime between the Exodus uh, um, you know, where they part through the Red Seas and, and uh, sometime between the Exodus and his death. And depending, there are differences in the dates that some people use, but uh, you know, a conservative date is around 1450 to 1400 BC, or maybe even as uh, late as 1300 BC is roughly when the book of Genesis was written. Now, Moses, as the author of Genesis, Moses, remember, if you remember from the story, he's floating down the Nile and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and raises him in Pharaoh's house. So being raised in Pharaoh's house means that Moses was educated uh, in Egypt. He received a vast uh, an extensive education as a person who's growing up in Pharaoh's house. And a huge part of that education is being educated in the religious ideas of his day. In my opinion, it is very likely that part of this education included gaining a knowledge of the oral traditions that contained the information from Genesis. He could have got that from the Jews. The Jews are enslaved there in Exodus. They're preserving these stories. I'm sure he had access to that. Now, in addition to receiving this education as preparatory for writing the Pentateuch, Moses also spent, remember this, prolonged periods of time with God himself. And the Pentateuch draws out for us. He spoke to God as a man speaks to a man face to face. So therefore, God himself may have verbally given him leading or instruction or guiding in composing these, uh, these books. We don't know for sure, but I don't think that's a, a too crazy of a speculation to think that as Moses is spending all this time alone with God face to face as the one who's going to compile the Pentateuch, maybe he has God you know, for, uh, for some instruction and guidance on, on, on composing uh, this book. And that's not always the case with every book in the Bible. Other books in the Bible, a guy just writes a letter to somebody and the Spirit 
is superintending that and inspiring him and leading him to write an inerrant, perfect message. But sometimes, as with Moses, he actually has direct access to God. It's possible he consulted the Lord uh, with some of those things. Just as Paul says in Galatians 2, he re- how did Paul receive his theology? You remember? A revelation of Jesus Christ. He's actually like talking to him. You know, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, he's been in the third heaven and heard things that you can't utter. Some of the authors of scripture had that kind of access to God and some did not. Uh, and so anyways, Moses is educated uh, in, in, in Egypt. He surely has access to the oral traditions and he was in God's presence face to face probably more than anybody in, in the scriptures besides Jesus. So <clears throat> um, there's a little bit about authorship and date and setting. Okay? Now I want to move into some other considerations about the book of uh, Genesis. And <clears throat> I'd like to state that in order to understand the book of Genesis, in, in my opinion, in the most enriching way possible, I believe it is r- absolutely crucial to approach it understanding that it is a story. And not only is it a story, but it, itself, just that book itself, but also it's the beginning of God's larger story that covers the entire Bible. And like all stories, the book of Genesis and, and the Bible itself, it has a clear beginning, a clear middle, and a clear end. And Genesis is the beginning of the story. And as is true with all stories, whether it be movies or books, we have to allow the story to unfold and we have to let the story tell itself on its own terms. As a story continues to unfold, specifically the story of God's glory in Christ and the scriptures, as it continues to unfold and reveal more and more truth to us, the idea of that taking place is what's called progressive revelation. As the story is unfolding, things are being progressively revealed through the scripture. In other words, not everything's revealed all at once, right up front. The story has to tell itself. You don't watch a movie and you know the whole movie in the first five minutes. You have to watch all two, two and a half hours of this. Same thing with the word of God. <clears throat> so here, here, here's something I want to say kind of to balance what, what, what I'm saying again. I, I will joyfully concede that a person can be saved off of one Bible verse that contains the gospel. And at the same time, I want to also say that even though that is true and that's wonderfully true, it, it's, I, I would also say it is also true that it is impossible to know God's word in a solid and thorough manner without understanding the beginning of the story. I'm not saying you can't be saved without understanding the the beginning of the story, but you can't have a thorough and strong grasp if you don't know the beginning of, uh, of the story. I mean, think about it. Do you ever watch movies or read books by beginning with the fifth movie or the fifth book in a six part story? I mean, who does that? You're not, there's going to be, yeah, you could get something out of the fifth movie. You've never seen anything before, but you are going to be missing so much information that it's not going to be nearly as enriching to you as it would be if you had seen the movies that led up to it. But, uh, and it's, it's no different with the Bible, but unfortunately we treat learning the Bible in the same way as if we're going to watch the fifth movie of a six part series. That's the movie we're going to start with. So often we treat the Bible that way. We give out new testaments and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But the, what, what, what is the new Testament? The new Testament is replete with explaining how the old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. If you have no grasp of the Old Testament, how are you going to have a strong grasp of the new? You can't. Yes, you can be saved by knowing things in the New Testament. You can even grow by not having an Old Testament. But there's going to be significant limitations to that. And so it is my exhortation to you to not be content to just know enough to be saved. But rather, hunger and thirst to know God's word and grow in understanding and understand 
how it, how it unfolds. Because the word of God, all of it, Paul says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for correction and rebuke and training in righteousness so that the man of God will be fully equipped, right? All scripture. And so all of the word of God, it, it's, it's like firewood that you're, you're stuffing into your heart. Your heart, say, is like a fire pit. And you take all, the more of the word of God that you take in and understand, it's putting firewood, more logs in that pit. And then the spirit comes along and it can light a stronger fire if there's more wood inside the pit of your heart. And your fire of love and joy and zeal for God can burn brighter the more logs that are in there. What are the logs? The Word of God. And so, don't hear me saying you can't be saved or you can't love God or, or serve God if you don't know the whole Bible. I'm not saying that. However, I am saying that you cannot know the Word of God nearly as, as you ought if you don't give yourself to trying to, to, to grasp the scriptures. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in order to have the stronger scripture, a grasp of scripture as you can, whenever you're at a particular passage in scripture, if you know where it came from, and you know how it's functioning in its own context, and you also know where it's going, you have a really solid grasp of the Bible. Now, that is a lot harder work to know the scripture that way, but it is so worth it, and it is so enriching. And so if you don't know the Bible as a story, if you don't know how it connects to the rest of scripture, that's okay for today. It's okay. I, you don't have to like beat yourself up or anything, but I would just encourage you to give yourself to fixing that. Give yourself to learning and enjoying growing in your understanding of the Word of God. Enjoy the process of gaining a more thorough understanding of the glory of God from your, from your uh, Bibles, you won't be sorry that you did so. So, <clears throat> I believe that if we embrace, that, we, we must embrace the Bible as a story. And like all stories, it contains exciting plots. There are twists. There are unexpected turns that happen uh, throughout the scriptures. And as the story unfolds, all of the plots and twists and turns of this story, they all come to a wonderful head in the glory of Jesus Christ. If we let the story tell itself, rather than importing what we want the story to say onto the real story and thereby twisting it, if we let the story tell itself, there is a wonderful simplicity and clarity and majesty and glory in this great story. And so the book of Genesis specifically is a story about origins. In fact, the Greek word for Genesis means origins. And the Hebrew word for Genesis means in the beginning. And so in the book of Genesis, some of the most fundamental questions about the issues of life are clearly addressed and answered. Most people at some point in their life wrestle with the question of, is there a God? And if so, who is he? Most people wrestle with the question of wanting to know where did everything come from? Most people wrestle with the question of wanting to know where they themselves came from. Most people, especially suffering people, they want to know where evil came from. People wrestle with the question of what's unique and special about human beings. Other people wrestle with the questions of where did all the nations and people groups in the world come from? Other people ask questions, what's the deal with Israel? Why are they such a big deal all the time in so many different uh, arenas? Other people ask questions, where, where, did the, where did goodness and love and peace come from? Still others ask the question, when I look out on this world and see so much sin and heartache and destruction, is there any hope at all? Genesis, because it records a real and literal and true history of an actual God, of a literal people who actually existed, and literal historical events that actually took place, Genesis wonderfully and clearly answers these questions for us. <laughs>
And it is important for us to know the origin of things because origins is a key and fundamental part of identity. Virtually every story's major plot lines and major characters have the origin of the plot and the origin of the character revealed within the story. Good stories help you understand origins as a crucial understanding and crucial, or I'm sorry, as a crucial component to understanding the overall story. And the Bible has given us many answers to the origin of the most important things we need to know. Genesis records the stories of the origins of the questions, uh, I'm sorry, the origins of the answers to the questions I just put forth. And then as the story unfolds, the story not only tells us what happened, but also the story of the Bible provides its own interpretation and meaning of those stories as they unfold. And so if we discipline ourselves to listen to the story, then we can find the liberating truth of some of the most crucial questions in life as the Bible progressively reveals the answers to us. So one of the key features to the story of Genesis, and I would argue to the entire Bible, is the story of the power and the triumph of God's word. In Genesis, we see that God's word is the incredible force that creates and sustains all things in the universe. In this study, we'll see that God's word gives the design and purpose for all of creation, including humanity. In this study, we'll see that God's word creates good things. In this study, we'll see that God's word defines sin and God's word warns about the consequences that will follow sin. And when sin enters the world, the consequences of sin unfold exactly as God's word decreed it would and the entire creation is cursed by the word of his power. Now, in this study, we will see also that God, through the word of his promise, he gives hope to creation, the, the, the creation that is cursed, by providing a promise that the seed of the woman, whom we will see is none other than Jesus Christ, that one day he will come and he will destroy the serpent, and he will destroy the ser serpent's works, namely the introduction of sin and the curse and death. And it is also promised that um, there will be hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And ultimately, the seed of the woman will be victorious. And Genesis records how these things begin to play out. And so as this story unfolds, we see that the only thing that can undo the curse, which came by God's word, is the promise of God, which is also by God's word. And so the promise unfolds and plays out throughout the entire book of Genesis, as well as the rest of scripture. And throughout the story, we see that sin and the persecution of God's people and natural disasters and the misguided and worldly thinking and mistakes of God's people and the sins of God's people and the devil himself and wars and doubts, none of it can thwart or stop the word of God's promise. And there is a ton of hope in that. Now, as it pertains to the structure of the book of Genesis, there's a lot of different ways that someone could choose to break this down. To me, I'm going to just break down the structure of Genesis uh, in two basic ways. First, you have chapters 1 through 11. And the first 11 chapters of Genesis comprise what is known as the primeval history. And the word primeval speaks to things associated with the very first age of human history. It's like the oldest of the old. And so Genesis 1 through 11, it carries us through the very beginnings of time. And in this section, we have the record of creation, 
We have the record of the fall. We have the record of the seed promise. All of this opens up in the first three, uh, three chapters of the book of Genesis. And all of it plays out in the lives of the first human beings created, namely Adam and Eve. Now, chapters 4 through 11 are driven and dominated by and unfold in light of the promise of the seed of the woman. Every single event in those chapters is an outworking of that promise. It's what holds all of it together. And the seed promise is central to major events in those chapters like the murder of Abel by his brother Cain or the story of Noah and the flood or the story of the Tower of Babel. All of those stories are driven and to be understood in light of the seed promise. It's what's holding all of them together. And so as we study through these passages that contain the history of the most ancient of times uh, in humanity, we're going to see the centrality and the dominance of the promise of God. <clears throat> now, the next section in Genesis, I, I would argue just chapters 12 through 50. It's a different focus of, uh, a, a focus of time, and it slows way down. The first 11 chapters, it's coming. The beginning of history through thousands of years up to uh, leading us up to Abraham. Chapter 12 slows down to record three generations of one family. Or chapter 12 through 50, excuse me. In chapter 12, we will meet a man named Abraham. And what is particularly significant about Abraham is the fact that we are going to encounter a series of promises made to Abraham, which make up what is called the Abrahamic covenant. Now, the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, they are stated and they are developed and further fleshed out and they begin to be stated in chapter 12. And we see more promises unfold all the way through chapter 17. In fact, some could argue chapter 22 gives its own uh, additions to it as well. And I'll explain what I mean by that more when we get there. <clears throat> but all of these promises make up what's called the Abrahamic covenant. And I would argue the Abrahamic covenant essentially takes the seed of the woman promise and gives much more development and fleshing out of that promise. The Abrahamic covenant is often summed up as God promising to give Abraham a special land to live in, which we'll see is the land of Canaan. God, it also contains the promise of God promising Abraham an offspring that's going to come from him that is vast and numerous. And then the third summarization of the Abrahamic covenant is that God will promise to bless Abraham and his people with the knowledge of God. Now, there are other promises in the Abrahamic covenant, but they kind of tend to fall under the categories of land, seed, and blessing. And so <clears throat> the covenant promises to Abraham, they literally drive and shape every single event that unfolds from Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 50. And I'll show you how when we go through there. But all of the historical episodes in those chapters, they take place as outworkings of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant in one shape or another. And once we realize that, Genesis becomes wonderfully clear and understandable. Now, as we see the Abrahamic covenant shape the history of Genesis, we see this history shaping covenant dominate the lives of three prominent figures. And these prominent figures are <clears throat> figures whom the Bible refers to as the patriarchs. And these three figures are Abraham, his son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob. These three men are called the patriarchs because they're considered to be the fathers of the faith. And specifically, they are also the fathers of the nation of Israel through the Abrahamic promise. It is to Abraham that God first makes the promise of land, seed, and blessing. And he makes them to Abraham even though Abraham's wife Sarah is barren and is very old and can't have children. God still promises that she will have, uh, Abraham will have a vast offspring. And the only way that this promise could come to pass is by the power of God's promise. 
And we'll see through the book of Genesis, eventually Abraham does have a son by Sarah, despite the impossibilities of old age and barrenness, and that son is Isaac. And so the life of Abraham is of huge significance in Genesis as well as the entire Bible. And we're going to first meet Abraham in chapter 11. And then Abraham's going to depart from us in chapter 25 where his death is recorded. And so from chapters 11 through 25, Abraham, that, that, that span covers the life of one man. And if you look at chapters 11 through 25, we see this particular man receives much more detail and attention than any character we meet before him. I mean, Noah has four chapters. Abraham has 15. And so the reason for that, I believe, is because his life and God's dealings with him and the promises with him, they are of such major importance in all of the Bible. And therefore, there's much more material on Abraham than anybody who comes before him. Now, Isaac, he serves as the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham for offspring. And the scripture makes no secret that the birth of Isaac was miraculous and that it is, Isaac, it is in Isaac and through Isaac that all of the Abrahamic promises will ultimately come to pass. Now, Isaac is born in chapter 1, and he has a prominent role in the story through chapter 27, and then Isaac disappears until his death in chapter 35. So, of the three patriarchs, Isaac has by far the least written about him. But Isaac's significance is that he represents the power of God to fulfill the promise to Abraham despite what is impossible with man. So, Isaac's the second patriarch. The third patriarch in, in Genesis is Jacob. And Jacob is one of Isaac's son, and later on, Jacob is renamed. Jacob the man becomes renamed as Israel. That becomes Jacob's name uh, down the road. He is the man Israel. And Jacob is the one who will emerge as, the, uh, in my opinion, the most prominent of the patriarchs in Genesis. And I think that's made clear just by the sheer volume of material on Jacob's life in this book. Jacob is born, and his, his, Jacob's birth is recorded in Genesis 25. And his death is not recorded for us until chapter 50. And so the life of Jacob takes up half of the book of Genesis. And it, it is, it, it, it's from Jacob that the 12 tribes of Israel are descended. And one of Jacob's sons, his son Judah... He is promised to have a descendant who will be a lion and who will one day reign as God's king over all peoples. So <clears throat> throughout the lives of the patriarchs, we will see the Abrahamic promise. It's still going to prevail despite the sins of the patriarchs. Despite the many blunders of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, despite their misguided attempts to fulfill God's word by their own worldly schemes, the word of God is still going to triumph. And we also see that it is the Abrahamic promise that shapes and gives meaning to the major events in the lives of the patriarchs. Whether we are talking about Abraham's war against the kingdoms in Genesis 14 uh, uh, or we're talking about the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah or God's dealings with Pharaoh and the Egyptians during the famine in Abraham's life or whether we're talking about God's dealings with Abimelech and the Philistines or the birth of Isaac or the obtaining of Rebekah as a wife for Isaac or the birth of Jacob's children or the famine that ultimately leads Jacob and his offspring into Egypt at the end of Genesis. That, uh, 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 um, all of these things are driven and shaped by the Abrahamic covenant. Every one of those events is an outworking of one or more of the promises made to Abraham. And when you understand that, that paradigm of how Genesis unfolds, it's wonderful because not only does it bring a lot of clarity to the Bible, but it brings a wonderful God-centeredness to this story. Um... <clears throat> 
Now, in light of talking about how the, prom the, the promises are so dominant in the book of Genesis, something else that is very important that we realize as well in relation to promise and fulfillment. And what I have in mind specifically is that one of the critical interpretive issues in the book of Genesis is understanding that the promises of God, specifically the seed of the woman promise and the promises contained within the Abrahamic covenant, those promises are fulfilled multiple times. That is critical to understand. Throughout the lives of the people of the book of Genesis, we can see the same promise being fulfilled over and over again in numerous ways. However, as we see that, none of the promises given in the book of Genesis has its final, ultimate, or consummate fulfillment within the book of Genesis itself. Rather, we will see that these promises come to a final, complete, and ultimate fulfillment in Christ and eventually in his making all things new in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, this is really important for us to understand because it's essential that we recognize the promise is being fulfilled in the events of Genesis so that we can worship and appreciate how God fulfills his word and give him glory. Now, at the same time, it's also important for us to recognize that even though the promise may have some level of fulfillment in the lives of the people of Genesis, there still awaits a final and ultimate fulfillment yet to come. Recognizing this component of fulfillment causes us to look forward to Jesus Christ and how he will bring the promises to their consummate realization in himself. So, the promises that we'll encounter in the book of Genesis, they are fulfilled multiple times in Genesis itself. But those fulfillments are never ultimate. Later on, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the promises in Genesis also have other fulfillments in other books and other episodes recorded later in the New Testament. But again, just like with Genesis, even those fulfillments, they're not ultimate and consummate, but nevertheless, they are real. Ultimately, all of the promises are fulfilled in a final and consummate way in Jesus. And then it is all believers in Christ who will eventually be made sharers of these promises as they're fulfilled in him. I'll give you an example okay, of a promise that's made and how it's fulfilled and it's really fulfilled, but it keeps there's still more fulfillments to come of it. Okay, here's an example. God promises Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, and in chapter 17 that Abraham will have vast offspring and that in his offspring, all of the Abrahamic promises will be fulfilled. Now, the first fulfillment of that is the birth of Isaac. <clears throat> when Isaac is born, the text is careful to tell us that he was born as the Lord had what, said. That's a fulfillment of the promise. Okay? So it is right there fulfilled in Isaac, the seed promise. Okay? Now, the birth of Isaac itself is a fulfillment of that promise. And then Isaac, in his life, he enjoys some of the fulfillments of the other Abrahamic promises in his life. And I'll tell you more about what those are when we get there. However, Abraham dies, then Isaac dies, and the promises uh, have not yet been realized in an ultimate and consummate way. So we have to keep looking forward to Isaac's descendants to see the promise come to pass. As we keep looking forward, Jacob comes on the scene. And the birth of Jacob is another fulfillment of the seed of the woman promise and of the Abrahamic promise. <clears throat> um, and because Jacob is the literal son of Isaac and the literal grandson of Abraham, and Jacob becomes the heir of the Abrahamic covenant promises. Now, in the life of Jacob, there are wonderful fulfillments of the promises in his life. However, just like with Abraham, just like with Isaac, they are non-ultimate. And as soon as you see the promises fulfilled in Jacob's life, you praise God and you see the God-centeredness of this event as promise and fulfillment, but you also keep looking forward because it's non-ultimate. 
Jacob has 12 sons. And it is through those 12 sons that the 12 tribes of Israel descend. And these sons, the 12 sons of Jacob, they represent a fulfillment of the seed promise. But God promised Abraham a vast offspring, not 12 grandkids. That's not vast. But nevertheless, it is a real fulfillment. And then from out of the book of Genesis, those 12 tribes, by the time we get to the book of Exodus, they have produced such a vast offspring that Pharaoh is afraid of them, even though they're slaves. That's another fulfillment of the Abrahamic seed promise. But again, even that is not the final ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic seed promise. If you keep looking forward into the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that it is Jesus Christ who is the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3 tells us the exact same thing, that Christ is the true singular seed of Abraham and he himself is the true heir of all the Abrahamic promises. So we see, what, how does, here's the promise. Hey, Abraham, you're going to have a vast offspring. Okay, fulfillment in Isaac, one dude. Moving forward from there, fulfillment in Jacob, one guy. Moving forward from there, 12 tribes. Okay, 12. We're going from 1 to 12. Good. Moving forward from the end of Genesis to Exodus, there is a big nation that's innumerable. Sweet. Moving forward from Exodus, the nation of Israel. Bang, it's Jesus. Looking at Jesus in Galatians 3, he's the seed of Abraham. It tells us that in Galatians 3, in the middle of the chapter. But by the end of the chapter, who else is it? Jews or Gentiles, whoever is in Christ by faith. Boom, another development of the seed promise. So you see how it goes. It, it, here's the promise, real fulfillment, but not ultimate in Isaac, then Jacob, then the 12 tribes, then the nation of Israel, then Jesus himself, then all believers. Progressively unfolds. And each stage of the fulfillment's a real fulfillment, but they're not ultimate until you see it at the very end. The dwelling of God is with men in the new heavens and the new earth. Outside of the dogs, you know, they're not in the dwelling of God. But who's with him? You know, those who persevered in the faith and love, love the Lord and are believers. So it continues to unfold. The promises, every one of them will encounter in Genesis. That's how they work. And when you see that, oh man, it's so cool. Because the scriptures just start holding together in a wonderful, wonderful way. So, <clears throat> if, um, it's important for us to, as we see the fulfillments of the promises in the Old Testament, to understand they're non-ultimate because that causes us to keep looking forward to the fulfillment of Christ. But the reason that it's also important for us to recognize these are real fulfillments is because it gives a rich meaning to these stories. They're not just weird stories. I mean, have you ever read the story of Moses when he's on his way to, back to Egypt and then his wife out of nowhere after Moses wrestles with God face to face, hey, I'm going to send you to deliver my people. And Moses like, no. And there's these dramatic interchange with him and God and the leprous hand and the snake and the staff and all that stuff. He's on his way back in obedience to God to deliver uh, Egypt by the promise of God. And his wife just circumcises his kid and puts the foreskin on his feet and is like, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And God almost kills him. I mean, that's weird. You understand that story in light of the Abrahamic promise? It makes perfect sense. But if you don't understand how the promise impacts those types of stories, you're like, man, these are the weirdest stories and I have no idea why they're in the Bible. So it's very important to understand promise and it unfolds progressively and in stages. I beat that horse now for probably 20 minutes. And the reason is because I want that to really stick. It is so important. <clears throat> so um, the final key issue I want to cover tonight uh, that I believe is very important in grasping the Christ-centeredness and uh, message of Genesis is to understand what typology is. And before I get into that, I want to just pause. Does anyone have any questions on anything I've stated so far? It's okay if you do. I know it's a lot to take in at once. That's why I exhorted you to keep going back and forth to this as we unfold. Is there any questions so far? About the, especially about the promise unfolding in stages. 
Okay. <clears throat> Typology. Typology is something that you've probably heard a lot, but maybe you don't really know what it is. If that's the case, it's okay. A lot of people don't know what it is. The more I hear people talk about it, the more I hear like, man, you don't know what it is. Uh, typology is a, fo is, it's a type of prophecy or a form of prophecy or a species of prophecy. Typology is prophecy, but it's not all types of prophecy. It's a specific kind of prophecy. It is not a typology is not a prophecy that verbally predicts something's going to come in the future. I'll give you an example of uh, Genesis 49, verses 8 through 11. Jacob predicts, okay, verbally, that from Judah, Judah is a lion's cub, and there's going to be this descendant that comes, and the scepter of God is with him, and he's going to rule the nations with the iron scepter, and everybody's going to be obedient to him. That's a prophecy that's saying, one day this will happen, and then it happens, okay? Typology is not that kind of prophecy. Typology, it's a prophecy that is a person or an event or an object that embodies the promise of God in such a way that it gives a clear pointer to how that promise is going to be fulfilled in Christ. I'm going to give you an example at the end of the message here. Now listen, every valid type in the Bible, this is so important to understand. Every real and valid type in the Bible, it is a literal, historical, and actual person, event, or object. And it is something that is that very hermeneutically clear, and it has a real, tangible, actual, and literal connection to God's promise. So the literalness of the thing or the person can be easily proven from the scriptures using sound interpretive principles. And what also can be easily proven from the scriptures is its literal connection to a promise of God. That's a type. Now the fulfillment of a type is referred to as the anti-type. So when I say anti-type throughout the series, I mean fulfillment of the type. Okay. So the anti-type, just like the type, it is also a real, literal, historical, actual person or event. And it is also very clearly, tangibly, and literally a fulfillment of the promise. And so just as with the type, the anti-type can be clearly proven from the scriptures as something that is actual and real and historical and literal. And also, just as with the type, the anti-type can be easily demonstrated from the scriptures that it is tied to the promise. Now, understanding that a type and its anti-type is literal and historical and it has a clear and obvious connection to God's promise, the reason that's so important is because it brings hermeneutical accountability to typology. Now, does everybody know what hermeneutics means? Fancy word mom's going to make fun of me for uh, at the end of the message. Hermeneutics means the art and science of interpretation. So when I say hermeneutics, I'm talking about interpreting the Bible. Okay? And so when I mean something is hermeneutically accountable, it means you can check, and using sound interpretive principles, you can check and see if it's actually in the Bible. That's what hermeneutical accountability means. So the reason understanding typology and the, uh, the type and the anti-type is a real, literal, historical thing with real, easily demonstrable connections to the promise, the reason that's so important is because it brings accountability to interpreting the types of the Bible. Um. <clears throat> This is extremely important, and you'll, you'll know more what I mean by, as we work through uh, the book of Genesis. Now, there are some people who wrongly speak of typology as allegory. They think typology is allegory, and allegory is typology. And when people say stuff like that, they show that they don't really understand either of them because they are not the same. Allegory is very different from typology. 
As I mentioned earlier, typology is something that is real, that is literal, and that is historical. And it also has a real and literal and historical connection to the promise of God that can be easily tested and measured by good hermeneutics and interpretive principles. Allegory, on the other hand, it finds a deeper meaning in things in a way that the deeper meaning is not in any way literally or historically connected to the person, event, or object. With allegory, allegorists argue that the true meaning of the text is detached from any literal sense of what's going on in the text. They just sort of make stuff up. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. Allegory is extremely different than typology. And oftentimes, allegory is a misuse of the scripture. And there, the, the problem with allegory is there's no accountability. Hermeneutically, you say, hey, man, I see, you know, here's a tree. Abraham plants a tamarisk tree here in Genesis. I see a deeper meaning of the cross here. And I was like, what? It don't have anything to do with that. There's no accountability with allegory. You're just making stuff up. And that's why it can be a very dangerous way of interpreting the Bible. Typology, on the other hand, though, it's like, hey, look, Abraham's a real person. This is a real event. This really happened. It's really connected to this promise. Look at this picture it creates. Oh, hey, look at Jesus at the fulfillment. He's a real person. He really does the same exact thing. Here's the real great fulfillment in him. Do you see these correspondences? There's great accountability there between the two things. Whereas allegory, there's not. So here we go. To be clear of what I mean between the difference between allegory and typology, I'm going to give you from the book of Genesis what a, uh, a valid type is, and then I'm going to give you an example of allegory from the book of Genesis to hopefully help you understand the difference. <clears throat> Let's start with a biblical type. Joseph, who's the son of Jacob, his favored son, jo Joseph is one of the most wonderful and clear types in the Bible, and his entire life creates a wonderful prophetic picture of what's going to come in Christ. We're going to break this down more when we get there, but here's the paraphrase. Joseph is a literal and historical person, okay? That's a rule of a typology. It's got to be real and literal and historical. Joseph is literally a descendant of Abraham. Joseph literally rises to power in Egypt by a literal betraying of his brothers through a literal enduring of unjust suffering. Now, as Joseph humbly submits to his suffering, he is literally exalted to a position of power. And in that position of power, as the seed of Abraham, eventually he has literal authority over a literal seven-year storehouse of grain during a severe famine. And at this time, the nearby world is starving because of this famine. These are all literal, historical, real things. Now, as the surrounding nations come to Joseph, who is the literal seed of Abraham, Joseph literally blesses the nations by providing them with grain, which is the bread that gives them life. All of these things are literal, they're historical, they are hermeneutically measurable, and they are wonderful outworkings of the Abrahamic promise to bless the nations through the seed of Abraham. Painting this picture of Joseph, it is very easy to demonstrate from the Bible, and it is very easy to prove from an interpretive standpoint. That's the type. Okay? What's the anti-type? What's the fulfillment of that? Listen, for those of you who know the gospel well, just giving you the type, you should be able to put all of this together yourself. The anti-type of Joseph, or the fulfillment of Joseph as a, a, a type in the prophetic picture his life gets, is Jesus. Jesus is also literally the seed of Abraham. Jesus was literally betrayed by his own kinsmen. Jesus literally endured unjust suffering. And yet through that unjust suffering, Jesus literally rose and ascended to a literal position of power, Philippians 2, whereby through his gospel, he literally blesses the nations by giving of his literal self to them as the bread of life, John 6. So Joseph as the type and Christ as the anti-type can all literally and very easily be shown from the scriptures to be historically true and thoroughly connected to the promises of God. That's good typology 
and that is good hermeneutics. Now, to give you an example of allegory, some of this stuff gets funny. Uh, to give you an example of allegory, Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 and 2, in those verses, we read that Abraham's wife, Sarah, dies. And when she dies, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore him six sons. And Abraham gave them gifts when he was near the end of his life. Now, the whole point of Genesis 25 is Abraham's passing off things to his heirs. There's Ishmael, there's Isaac, and there's his sons from Keturah. And the whole point of it is to show how Isaac's the covenant son. But here's some of the stuff that people come up with. I have heard some people say that the six sons of Abraham from Keturah, they represent the six spirits of virtue and of wisdom. That has nothing to do with what's in Genesis 25. There is nothing about wisdom and virtue or anything mentioned there. It just says he had these six sons and he gave them gifts. But you have people go off on entire sermons about the six virtues of wisdom from Abraham's son. It has nothing to do with what's going on in Genesis 25. That's a totally detached meaning from the, set, from the text. Now, I read something... Uh, uh, I read something online that said that Origen, uh, a church... Uh, a church, uh, a guy from church history, an old teacher of the Bible back a long time ago, Origen said that the death of Sarah, Abraham's wife, it was the perfection of virtue and that Abraham's marriage to Keturah represented his continual pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. What? That has nothing to do with anything in the text. That's just not there. This is guys finding stuff in the text that they're just pulling rabbits out of hats. None of this stuff is actually there. So these guys in these interpretations, they're assigning meaning to these things that is totally detached from what's actually going on. That's called allegory. And that, those examples are super, super different than Joseph as a type. And it's very important to understand those differences. And so here's our kind of our, our closing point here. The last point I want to uh, close the introduction with is that Jesus Christ is the theme of all of the Bible and the book of Genesis is dripping with his glory. In Luke 24, 27, and in Luke 24, 44, as I already said, we can see, I read it earlier in the, in, the, in the message, Jesus himself says he's the grand subject of the book of Moses, and for our purposes, the book of Genesis is included in that. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted in all the scriptures the things written concerning himself. All, uh, uh, that's Christ's own hermeneutical or interpretive key to understanding the Old Testament. It's all moving to him. In John 5, 46, I mentioned this earlier as well, Jesus is in a dispute with the Jews over healing a man on the Sabbath, with the, which the Jews felt was a violation of the law of Moses. And as Jesus was debating them, he said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me because he wrote of me. So again, Jesus clearly declares that the substance of what Moses wrote in the first five books, which includes Genesis, it's pointing to Christ, it looks to Christ, and it's fulfilled in Christ. In John 8, the Jews were trying to kill Jesus, and they were having a debate with him about the origins of Jesus. Where did he come from? And in this debate, Jesus claims that he's God, that he's the great I am who preceded even Abraham. And these Jews, they claim to be God's true people because they're physically descended from Abraham. But Jesus, he burst their bubble by telling them that they're from the devil because they're trying to kill him and their actions are therefore demonic. And in telling them this, Jesus speaks of Abraham in John 8, 56. And here's what he says about Abraham. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Okay, well, where do we read about the life of Abraham? In Genesis how, when in the world did Abraham see Jesus' day and rejoice? I believe strongly that Jesus is making a reference to Genesis 15, verse 1 through 6. And I'm going to argue more for that view when we get there. But the point I want to make now is that Jesus clearly sees that Abraham has a joyful, forward-looking faith in God and his promises, which will all culminate in Christ. 
So the book of Genesis, which Jesus sees as scripture and is scripture that was written by Moses, it is Christ-centered and he is the great subject of it. Two more verses. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that all of the Old Testament promises, they are fulfilled in Christ. And he said that by saying, all the promises of God find their yes and amen in him. Paul also said in Ephesians 1 verses 9 through 10 that the mysteries and purposes of God are to sum up all things in Christ of which the content of Genesis is a part. And so as we journey through this great book, we're going to see through the literal reading of the text, through God's promises that he makes, and through the progressively revealed message of scripture, and through many wonderful prophetic types, that Jesus is everywhere in Genesis. He's the sovereign creator and sustainer of the universe. He is the second Adam who will come as the seed of the woman and crush the serpent's head and undo the curse. He is the innocent and slain brother whose blood speaks a better word than that of Abel. He is the greater Noah who in him provides a consummate and final deliverance from the curse through his vessel of salvation. He is the seed of Abraham who's going to bless the nations that were cursed at Babel and he will bless them by giving them the knowledge of God. Jesus is the greater Isaac who is sacrificed and raised from the dead to secure the inheritance of the Abrahamic promise for his offspring. Jesus is the Melchizedekian king priest who builds the house of God. Jesus is Jacob's ladder or Jacob's tower that connects heaven and earth, which is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Jesus is the greater Joseph who through his suffering comes to power to provide the bread of life for the nations. Jesus is the descendant of Judah to whom will be the obedience of Israel and all peoples. And there is much, much more in Genesis that points to the glory of Christ. And so I am very much looking forward to exploring the Christ-centeredness of God's word with you. And so as we go through Genesis, I'm not going to waste time on distractions. I'm not going to spend 45 minutes on who are the Nephilim and uh, all of these random speculative issues and all kinds of crazy nuances about the end times. If that's what you're wanting, you will be very disappointed. We're just going to walk through what God says, what his promises are, and how they continually bring us to Christ in wonderful ways that are all complementary and yet unique. And so, hopefully as we go through this story, we will be enriched in finding the meaning of our own stories in the story of God and in the story of what he's done in Christ. I mean, isn't that why you watch movies or read books? That's why I do. I like to read books or watch a movie or take in a story because sometimes when I get outside of my own story and see someone else's, what I can learn by watching someone else's story helps me make sense of my own. And so we're going to journey through the story of creation and the glory of God in Christ and sin and the fall and redemption. And in that story, we find purpose and hope and meaning and joy and comfort for our own stories. So that's where we're going. So I know, again, that that's a lot of information. I promise I'm going to try to make these lessons in Genesis a smaller bite-sized chunk. But these are the principles that we're going to use to approach Genesis. So think about it. If you have questions about it, let me know. Uh, we can talk about it. Try to digest it. We'll go through Genesis, revisit some of these things, go through it, revisit some of these ideas, go through it and revisit these ideas. And hopefully by the end, you're not going to feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose, but you'll be able to see as I just read the story. You're going to have it so ingrained into your thinking of how Genesis works. You just see it. Usually it comes around chapter 28. Uh, every time I've taught through this, people feel like you feel now uh, in the beginning. But as it unfolds, it's so consistent. You'll just read it and you'll see how the promise is unfolding. And you guys will probably be preaching it to me. So, anyways, are there any questions or comments? Okay, well, uh, I encourage you to read ahead and, and, and stay in it. And, uh, whoops, I'm moving this mic. Got to get used to that.
I encourage you to read ahead and stay in the Word of God, and uh, I look forward to a lot of good, enriching, edifying discussions uh, about the Word of God and worship with you guys over the coming months or maybe even years. I don't know how long it's going to take. It's going to take as long as it takes. So anyways, uh, if there are no questions or comments, then uh, we could pray. Anybody have a question or comment? All righty. Well, let's pray, uh, and then we will have time for fellowship. Father, we thank you. I, 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 I'm, I'm so excited about your word, Lord. I just thank you for, I thank you for its simplicity, and I thank you also at the same time for its sophistication. It is simple enough to understand, for a, a, a three-year-old can understand the gospel and be saved, and yet there is this sophistication to it that even the smartest and godliest among us can never master. And so it, show, it surely it speaks to you. It speaks to your humility and your meekness as well as your majesty and your glory. Who can know the mind of God and uh, those things? I thank you for that, God. And I just pray for uh, us as your people during this season that you'll greatly strengthen our love for you and our confidence in your word uh, as we go through it and produce many good fruits uh, in our lives that will result in thousands upon ten thousands of praises for Jesus Christ. Lord, as we break into fellowship, I pray that you'll uh, bless us and build us up in that time. And I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.